We made this. Welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey. Hello and welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, the podcast about Red Dwarf, here on the We Made This Podcast Network. And that is what this episode is about, the We Made This Podcast Network. The We Made This Podcast Network is five years old this January, so all the network's podcasts are celebrating by doing weird and wonderful crossovers. Later this month, we've got some great, fun things planned for you, but what we thought we'd do is we'd post something from my other podcast, Chucky Vision, that featured hosts from Shipwrecked and Comatose. Because, you know, it's kind of a crossover, sort of. We did these things because I basically wanted to podcast with Matt and Kurt a little bit more. And they were about episodes of TV series that we like that featured dolls. You know, because Chucky is a doll. Not much crossover here, really, other than the hosts, but we thought that you'd like them as a curiosity anyway. And if you like Buffy, Angel, or The X-Files, then maybe these are fun little extras for you. We're posting these on a daily basis for the next three days. This is the first one. Matt joins me for a chat about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Welcome to Chucky Vision, the podcast about Chucky, Child's Play, and anything to do with that particular horror franchise here on the We Made This Podcast Network. My name is Mark Adams, and I am your host for this special episode in between series two and three of the television series Chucky. And with me at this time, as always, well, almost as always, is my co-host Dev. Hello, Dev. Hello. Are you going to hang that over me now from here on out? (laughs) Almost always. (laughs) Yes, you hate heart stopper, which means you hate love. Oh. But it's not just Dev and myself today. We are doing the first of a two-part series over two weeks in a kind of we're sad that series three of Chucky isn't happening yet because of the strike, but we fully support the strike because fuck people who don't pay people properly. That was a long introduction. Hello, Matt Latham. Hello. <laughs> so we've got Matt from Shipwrecked and Comatose and uh, Pick a Disc to join us because he loves Chucky. Oh, wait, he doesn't love Chucky. No, what we're doing is we're doing two episodes of other teleseries. First up is Buffy with Matt and next week is X-Files with Kurt. They both happen to be my co-hosts on Shipwrecked and Comatose, but they both like a particular thing that is relevant for this. So we thought we'd invite them on. Matt. Have you genuinely never seen a Chucky film? No. Fuck's sake, mate. The closest I think I've ever gotten to anything Chucky-like is one, the episode we're talking about, and Slappy from the Goosebumps books. Now, I know Dev likes Slappy, and you're kind of in between our ages. I didn't really encounter Slappy. I knew who he was because he was like the, the kind of icon of Goosebumps. Well, why is it that is it just that you're not into horror, or did you just not? Are you scared of dolls? Is there a reason why you've not seen any child's play? I'm I'm, I'm not particularly a fan of horror as a genre in general, or horror films or anything. I'm just the, the, the closest, the closest kind of franchise of I've watched that I've liked or can stomach watching is Scream, but that's mainly because it's more meta and kind of exploration of the genre rather than being a genre. Don't you miss out on some of the references, though, if you watch Scream and you haven't seen all the horror films? That's what TV, tro- TV tropes is for. <laughs> <laughs> but and I suppose another um, 
exception is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I know you're a huge fan of. And at one point you and I were talking about doing a Buffy podcast. What's, what is it about Buffy that kind of books the trend of you not being a big horror guy? I think TV horror is a lot different to kind of movie horror, particularly, well, this being a network TV show, you're not, it's not essentially going to be downright jump scare scary. And that's probably the main thing that I'm particularly wary of. I'm not a fan of jump scares. I'm particularly really kind of fucking hate jump scares and stuff to the point that I've, I have played games like video games like Until Dawn and Silent Hill 2. Before I bought them, I specifically went onto YouTube and YouTubed the jump scares on mute to make sure that I, I knew where they were coming so I could <laughs> play them. That's my main thing with the horror, with the horror genre is that I'm not a fan of jump scares or particularly unset, like kind of psychologically being unsettled either. I'd rather feel entertained than unnerved. So Jaws would be more scary than Saw for you, I suppose. I, I would not watch Saw. I'm, I'm not a fan of torture porn. Okay. Kind of stuff, yeah. So like, yeah, like, like overly grotesque kind of gore. I'm not a fan of either. <clears throat> so, so family friendly horror is what you like. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, basically stuff that would be on 8 p.m. on a American broadcast network with their very very strict broadcasting standards. <laughs> And um, teenagers that are in their 30s. None of them were in the 30s at this point. The closest was Chris McCarpenter. She was 29. A fucking 29 playing someone 16. Sarah Michelle Gellar was 19. During the- yeah, I know Sarah Michelle Gellar was vaguely the right age, but looked so much older. But it's, it's always been a bugbear of mine. It's the one thing I don't like about Buffy, other than what we found out about Joss Whedon, is that they all look like just adults, like... Even Sarah Michelle Gellar, who is still technically a teenager, she was, you know, she was a woman. And it really annoys me. Things like there's a massive kind of in between season one and two, she kind of she she kind of visibly ages. So when she, she goes from, Yeah. So like you can got she's got a very kind of almost like just post kind of teenage look in season one, but then season two, she it's only a few months, but she she looks like she ages a few years in between. Mm. But yeah, so what we're doing is we're looking at an episode of Buffy that features a dummy. And that episode was Series 1, Episode 9. It was broadcast in May 1997, which puts it pre-Ride of Chucky. At this point, we've only seen Child's Play, Child's Play 2, and Child's Play 3. And the episode is called The Puppet Show. Dev, are you a big fan of Buffy? Yes, I've um, binged all of the show during uni. So that would have been a good 10 years ago. I think Mm. I caught it just before the weed and stuff came out. So I managed to watch it unscathed. I finished Buffy, gave it a little pause before I was going to get into Angel. And then all the stuff started coming out. So I never actually got around to Angel. I actually just bought Angel on DVD. (laughs) So I'm finally going to get around to that show. (laughs) But Slight deviation is that I think at a certain point I remember because I was watching it from start to finish, and when it when we finally got on Sky, it came to the point where I preferred Angel mainly because it felt like Buffy was the opening match to the main event that was Angel because of the way it was scheduled. I preferred Angel as well. I think it just suited me a little bit better. It was aimed at a slightly older audience and. I kind of liked the concept of vampire detective. I thought that was quite fun. But Matt, did you ever do a watch where you you started at Buffy Series 1, got all the way to Buffy, Buffy Series 4, and then watched Buffy and Angel simultaneously because they were supposed to be in the same timeline? I've never fully been able to do that. I've got the Angel, Buffy and Angel DVDs. I've never actually watched the Angel DVDs all the way through, actually, because I've always meant to go and watch them all the way mm. to back. And I've never done that because I know I've never rewatched season five of angel not of any kind of personal choice of me disliking it i've just never got around to kind of doing a full rewatch of angel from front to back since it finished now i've just remembered there's a puppet episode of angel there is i'd forgotten that smile time maybe we could do <laughs> a third one of these. Matt, do you want to come back and talk about Smile Time? Yeah, because I've never rewatched it, actually. I've only watched it on the broadcast. Right, may- maybe not. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do, like, a sequel. We'll, we'll definitely do Buffy and X-Files. <laughs> but if we do Angel 
as well. We'll chuck that in at some point when we've got time to do it. I completely forgotten until we started talking about Serious Fire of Angel. There is a puppet episode and it's fucking great as well. It's it's much, much better than the puppet show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? right. Okay. Let's talk about the puppet show. You didn't think much of it because I thought it was one of the stronger episodes of series one of Buffy. I think just before we start recording, this is going to end up, this is kind of like the episode of the Buffy podcast we never got to make. So, True. so I'm kind of going into it with that, mainly because of my kind of like complete ignorance of Chucky in general. But yeah, season one of Buffy is kind of like a kind of unique outlier in terms of how it was kind of structured, written and kind of produced as like its own entity before it even aired. So it's it's got a, it's a very closed off, almost unique kind of tone and style and kind of production history. And, you know, it, it bothers me no end when people always put it near the bottom of their lists in terms of like their favorite seasons. Because I thought it might be a sort of might be kind of like nostalgic kind of biased kind of emotional love for that season but i've always kind of had a nice soft spot for it and no, there's none episodes in it i really dislike but it's, it's only kind of re-watching it about an hour ago that a couple of things have occurred to me <laughs> about this even though i've rewatched, even though technically i could have come here without rewatching it because i know the episode that well <laughs> in that in terms of buffy season one it's it's very it's serialized because it's one of the first shows I think that kind of did the kind of strict serialization in that if you kind of missed episodes you'd lose something and the overarching plot thing yeah yeah and that's not that apparent in season one but I think season one is still very kind of tightly you must watch them in an order then I then people I think give it credit for I was thinking about it and thinking oh well yeah, you can't get away with skipping episodes of it. And I was trying to think about it, about each episode. And I almost said that there's only one episode you could skip, which was Teacher's Pet, which is episode four with the Praying Mantis. But there are things in that, like I think it's like the first reappearance of Angel as a character. You could skip this one. I hadn't thought about it, but you could, couldn't you? There's no references to the master, the big bad. Yeah, there's. Yeah. this is my point, because there's. You, this is the only episode of the season I can think of that doesn't match any kind of teenage metaphor or it being about something in comparison to other episodes so you've got even teacher's pet which is about a giant praying mantis is still about kind of teenage crushes on on teachers the witch the witch is about kind of pressure like the, the, the overbearing parents but what also introduces the idea of witchcraft in there never kill a boy in the first day is about basically trying to juggle dating as a teenager with extra responsibilities the pack is about kind of friends turning to going a bit naughty and turning to bullies and it's just pet and the pack aren't very good Matt. <laughs> they are but still they but my point being is that they still have at least a hook that links into a kind of teenage problem uh, and then you got i robert you jane which is about which is a really dated yet enjoyable episode on catfishing you got nightmares which is more of a personal one you've got uh about Nightmares, which is about fears or what to do with the characters. Out of Mind, Out of Sight is about feeling lonely and being ostracised. And you've got Prophecy Girl, which is like one of the best episodes of TV ever made. It is. But this one doesn't... I couldn't. I can't think of any kind of te- metaphor which would relate to the teenage experience of this, apart from what, being forced to do a talent show. It doesn't feel as strong or as a key component to the episode as like other kind of teenage things... I think you're right that it doesn't fit the pattern. You're absolutely yeah. right. But I don't think I care because it's one of the strongest episodes of season one. But And it's entertaining, but I don't think you can skip this episode because the only arc thing that happens in this is that it's the first episode that has Principal Snyder in it. <laughs> okay. And he's incredibly important. Yeah. And I've never... I'm still, I'm about a decade, I've not rewatched really it in at least over a decade now. And I know for a fact that as I'm older and perhaps close to the age of Giles and the adult characters than I am, the teenagers. <laughs> Me too, mate. I was younger than the teenage characters when it first came out. <laughs> but I've got a feeling that I know I'm going to be a lot more sympathetic towards Snyder as a character as I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and I was watching this and it was already happening. And I think my appreciation of Snyder as a character has increased. <laughs> but in, term, yeah, in terms of the actual kind of important relevance in the whole show, it's very throwaway. And I think it kind of it's one of the weaker episodes in terms of its construction 
of what the show's main raison d'etre is to try and use a met- use supernatural as a metaphor for teenage life and growing up and all the kind of different th- things that people do with. They just I to this day cannot tell you what the second layer of storytelling that this is. I don't think it has one. I think it's just a monster of the week. And it's interesting that you say that because Buffy is kind of the gentle um, thing that people seem to think about Buffy is it's this overarching plot with a monster of the week, but they've missed the nuance that you've just talked about as an example of a monster of a week that just fits almost as a filler episode, because like I said, there's no master stuff. It's a monster of the week with characters that we've established and we like as that it's exceptional, but I do agree with what you're saying that it is missing the metaphor for teenage life. It is missing an important part of the overarching plot, but I don't care. There's a dummy. Even when he's kind of creeping and perving on a 16 year old girl. We'll get to that. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm surprised you haven't gone 90 zick yet. So. It's definitely 90 zick, but yeah. we'll get to that. What did you think of it in general, Dev? How did you feel it fitted in your kind of Buffy fandom watchery? I agree with quite a few points that Matt made. I think season one, I really do have a strong nostalgia for season one. I think it is essential, not just in the show, but like just in TV at the time. Like, because it did, you know, I love X Files, but the, 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 uh, you know, as we talked about the, the arcing story of the big bad, you know, the master in X Files, that shit is all over the place. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> that shit never makes any sense. But in this, it's so much more cohesive, and it is in those. It reminds me of like Supernatural. There's so many filler episodes of Supernatural that I would skip, but then they always throw in like a two minute scene at the end where there's a character drama moment where it's like, oh, you technically have to see that. That you know that de- that develops the story, but the whole other episode is completely filler. And yeah, I agree with this one. This is probably one of the the lightest episodes. And I think there's enjoyable elements. There's definitely enjoyable elements that I really like in this episode. But yeah, as you say, there's a mention I saw in the trivia of the uh, them talking about when Buffy says dummies ick her out. And uh, some of the other characters like Willow says she doesn't, she has like stage fright. And then Xander talks about how he doesn't like mimes. And then those do come into play like the very next episode in Nightmares. But then Nightmares is an episode that's actually doing something with that. Whereas here, there isn't that other layer. It's, it, I think it's a good conceit, you know, the talent show. That's a thing that all kids have to go through in high school, like either doing a talent show or laughing at the talent show. So I think it's, there's there's a very relatable concept there. But then, yeah, they don't really do much with it. It's a very light, shallow episode. I've got no problem with that. I, I don't really have a problem with Monster of the Week being a Monster of the Week if it's a cool Monster of the Week. And it was. I think the other problem with it is that I think the actual Monster of the Week thing is pretty weak until we get to, I mean, we'll just go into spoilers, until we get into the twist that Sid is on the good side. I think up mm. until then, it's pretty empty, really, in, t- in terms of the plot. Like, I kept thinking, like, it kept, uh, Principal uh, Snyder, I forgot how much he was in this episode as his first episode. Mm-hmm. Mm. But, like, he was in every other scene. And I didn't, maybe because it was the rewatch. I know where his character goes. But in this episode, it wasn't until the end where I was like, oh, we're meant to think he's the killer. Like, I didn't even think that. I was just like, why is he in this so much? So, you say that, but then that never crossed my mind until that we're supposed to think that Snyder's the villain until, like, a moment where he's creeping around the back the stage in about like in like 80 percent of the episode in the episode doesn't do anything at all to th- make you think that or try and even hint that he's the killer or whatever until perhaps he starts gulking around the back and now i don't know whether that's because again they said that we know it, where he's going and what the importance of the character is but i don't know I, I don't even think the episode even attempts to make you think is a red herring no, I thought so. I, I mean, uh, yeah. just because he's just not a nice man. <laughs> I think he's a quite obvious red herring, but I definitely think he's designed to be a red herring. Yeah, I do think in the writing he is meant to be one because he's always showing up in the half shadows where Buffy's investigating and stuff. I, I do think it's a good episode in establishing that he's going to be like a human obstacle for them. You can tell he's going to be a mm. problem in the future. But then at the same time, I think... 
I do think he's in it so much, more so because he's like a crutch for the writers. It's like they have this new character and he's kind of funny and he's in it so much. And like the actual investigating, you know, there's the Scooby investigating. It's probably one of the most Scooby-like episodes of them actually investigating who the culprit might be. But then it's kind of clever that we do see the killer throughout the episode, but then learning who it is, the twist, is just like, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't come together. It's just like, oh, it was that guy. <laughs> when you're mentioning about the kind of twist of the episode, I think, I was just talking that, I do think that perhaps one of the key things that the episode kind of does do, which the series straight at the bat tries to do, is take traditional tropes and spin them on their heads. So perhaps where, where the kind of focus may not be on the usual teenage kind of metaphor. What this one does do, I think, and perhaps focuses on in spite of that, is its idea of taking well-worn tropes of horror and twisting it on its head. So, I mean, I think the two of you probably know this a lot more better than me. I mean, is there any kind of other examples in fiction of the kind of creepy dummy being actually the good guy? Or is this kind of another outlier in that regard? Well, we looked at magic recently where there was a moment where is this dummy alive? And it wasn't, which we thought was quite fun because it was very different to Chucky. And similarly, you know, I suppose you could argue that uh, Glenn slash Glenda is a good guy. True. Yeah, that's a good example. In uh, Seed of Chucky. But that was post this. And Glenn and Glenda became two different characters and then became the same character again. It's all the... That storyline is all about their non-binary identity in the end. But um, they were very, very conflicted and very traumatised by their identity and by their upbringing and became good. Whereas, um, again, I, I know you said that it was 90s ick. I like that this is a flawed good guy in Sid. I do like that. It wasn't very sensitively done. And going back to our Josh Whedon ick, I think... It was handled poorly, but I don't actually have a problem with a flawed demon hunter who does do good things by by killing off demons being creepy. I don't really have a problem with that because people are human and that is realistic. I just feel like the way it was handled and the way he wasn't called on it properly and how it was treated as normal to be a, a dirty old man wasn't well written but the concept i actually quite liked i think as tv goes it was like the shorthand of it you know yeah he, he has been in that bo- uh, doll body for so long of course he's horny <laughs> like he's he's missing human interaction and i think the writing is like there's enough there for the audience to go oh well yeah i saw it see side or you know he's kind of gross but yeah i would have liked more i think the first half of the episode maybe spends too long with the suspense of that payoff, because there's the bare minimum to get his character and to get the the whole appeal of it. But I would have liked a bit more, maybe a bit, you know, a bit more explosion with him, some more dialogue scenes. I think that given another draft, I think what this episode could have done, which would separate it from other episodes, is perhaps being, he's capitalising more on Buffy seeing another kind of demon hunter or at least yes. kindred spirit. Because well, not before I watched him even though I had a strong memory this episode, I thought that aspect was a bit more than it was. I, my memory of it was that there was a bit more of an exploration of that. So there's the scene where, because he's talking about knowing a slayer in the 30s, in my head, I, I remember all the, the horny dummy, dummy is an act thing in the, the 1930s Korean, but in my head I kind of constructed a more of a dialogue between those two characters about the duty they have and what it meant and... In my head, I thought there was something a lot more there than there wasn't. But I think that there could have been a case of like Buffy either talking about why he did what he did and what she's got to do. And that probably could have been made the episode a bit more of a standout in terms of what that's doing in comparison to what the rest of the season was doing. Was Sid the first demon hunter that we encountered in Buffy? Because I want to say he is. I can't think of any other demon hunters or any other slayers prior to... Uh, the puppet show. I think, yeah, that's what I mean. I definitely agree with Matt there. I like that scene and it works for the bare minimum of what this episode probably, you know, needed. But I think I, w- I definitely wanted more because that, yeah, that's crazy that he used to know 
an earlier Slayer and he has all this history and then it doesn't really get explored. Although technically that did kind of, that, that was a weird setup. I don't think they even intended that for a setup that did end up paying off way later when Spike does kill that Slayer <laughs> in a later, yeah. like a later season in a flashback. So Sid, I really thought that when I first saw it, that we'd see more of Sid and we never did with one exception a video game that is, is it canon? Is it not canon? It's called Chaos Bleeds. It was an RPG and he was a playable character. And there was a very, very brief kind of bullshit plot on how he came back to life so you could play as him. And I don't know, would you have liked to have seen more Sid? I think that as a character, a lonely, pervy old man who's on the side of good, but need, perhaps needs an education. I think that could have been fucking fascinating. I don't know. I kind of like the idea of him kind of knowing that he has a purpose and that he knows that his purpose is coming to an end. So he has his place in the balance of good versus evil, particularly mm. when you, and again, going back to the idea of it having another stronger rewrite, particularly when you figure out where the season goes and, when the season ends with one of the best episodes of TV ever made, Prophecy Girl, in terms of where that mortality is tested and the duty between living a life and having to do what's right. I think that I think that, that, that the puppet show could have perhaps seeded that or raised those questions a lot more so that when you have Prophecy Girl in a few episodes' time to end the season, those themes of what Sid's role and what eventually he does to pretty much and, like to finish the demon and kind of go to his resting place and fulfill his role. Mm. I think that that would probably help seed prophecy girl a lot more. I think when mm. when the eventual kind of idea of mortality and going to a death is brought up for Buffy in the later in that later episode. Yeah, this is perhaps a little bit flippant, but uh, this is possibly more for you, Matt, than than for Dev. Do you think there was an element of they didn't want to have the difficult puppet, the difficult prop, for want of a better phrase, along the lines of the Scutters in Red Dwarf, because they were incredibly problematic. <laughs> Whereas, you know, something like Child's Play has the budget and the time allocated to the difficultness of having a puppet. Whereas I don't think a TV show would. C- uh, comparison to, say, Chucky, it's, uh, it's hardly as animated as Chucky ever was. No. Yeah, it's a ventriloquist doll. His mouth goes up and down. That's it. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a case of the show perhaps also being slightly aware of how cheesy the concept is in general anyway, and perhaps doesn't want to, didn't want to delve down that well too often. Was it cheesy at this point? We're talking 1997. We'd not had Bride of Chucky. We'd not had the satire. I think creepy dolls were a lot more creepy and a lot less ironic than they are now. I think, as we pointed out, the, this episode is a turning point of the uh, irony, where that is literally a joke when Buffy and Sid uh, fight in the middle act, and then they both blame each other for the, uh, killing the person yeah. and taking out their heart. And then there's that moment where they pause, and they're just like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, that was very comic book fighty, wasn't it? You want the two good guys that, are the, that sell the comics to fight, and then get together and then fight the bad guy together. That's a really, really tropey thing, particularly in comic books, like, you know, super, Superman versus Spider-Man or whatever. And um, that really stuck out as like, uh, as much fun as it was, it, 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 it just cheese. But the reveal, the, the twist was great. I don't know how that have got there otherwise, but I don't know, it just, maybe I've read too many comic books. <laughs> yeah, Everyone After is great. But yeah, the most arbitrary build up to that twist was the scene. Like, I like all of the investigation stuff, you know, them just, the main characters seeing the doll and going, ooh, that's weird. Him talking to his doll, that's kind of strange. But then uh, when we, the audience, see that dialogue between Morgan and Sid, and it's deliberately so out of context where Sid's like, she's the one, we gotta get her. And it's like, mm. I don't know, it felt arbitrary to keep saying about us, uh, set him up as the villain. Also, I think as well, considering there's a whole scene where Sid is pretty much taken by Xander and they're talking about finding the demon and stopping the, or at least thinking that Morgan's the demon or someone, there's a serial killer going out. You would have thought that Sid would have been listening. <laughs> yeah, that, that that scene does happen before 
Sid attacks Buffy, right? So yeah, wouldn't he be listening? Is there? Does he turn off at times? Yeah, good point. But what I was going to say is the theft of Sid. When you think about it, it's really quite cruel and bullying by Xander, and it's not called out by any of the other characters. Well, that's season one for you. And maybe Buffy as a whole, Sander's always kind of a dick and never really called out on. You're not wrong. <laughs> but no, stuff like that, I would have never spotted as I was watching it the first time around. And I think maybe, again, I'm gently more sensitive to unpleasant behaviour by characters that are supposed to be protagonists because of the Josh Whedon thing. And this is exactly why you and I didn't do a Buffy podcast, Matt. <laughs> yeah. And it's annoying that the everyman character is the bully here. Yeah, and it's very and it's really annoying that for years and years and years, Xander was like my favourite, but like my favourite TV character. I still have a picture of me and Nicholas Brendan on my wall in the hallway, which at the moment is still up. The same day that I had that photo taken, I had my photo taken with Alison Mack. <laughs> 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 so, um, oh. yeah, but yeah, I don't know. Um, on the one hand, I can see. I mean, yeah, it's a bit of a dickish thing to do, but then again, I can I do see the logic behind him taking him because then if Morgan because Morgan's on his own doesn't have the the puppet, then like Buffy can directly speak to to Morgan. But then again, I don't think that I do think that like Giles and Willow do mention about like the ethics of nicking <laughs> nicking Sid. Anyway, it's very very brief, but I don't think it's fully mm. it's not fully ignored. I think there are it's not particularly called not particularly like kind of called out um it's just like very subtly done by giles and willow i'm kind of amazed in that world that none of them even giles at once entertain the idea that sid might be possessed by a demon surely in this world weird shit like that has happened before i think is that i mean that like they've probably not just come across it or something that's not happened that often because i think there is stuff that willow finds later on and and in the library when she's helping Giles research that there are actually people that have moved essences or souls into inanimate objects. Again, what I really like, what I realize as well as I'm approaching the same age as Giles myself, I still know fuck all about anything. So I can guarantee <laughs> there's probably a load of lapsed lapses in yeah. Giles' own experience. So he might be quite knowledgeable about stuff in general, but there's probably specific experiences that he's not aware. So my, <laughs> I think my kind of uh, sympathy for Giles, perhaps not being aware of that, has increased as I've gotten older. <laughs> well, depending on how the show timeline works, last episode, last week, they did fight a demon that was stuck in a computer. <laughs> oh, that was a bad <laughs> fair episode. Enough, fair enough. <laughs> that is one of my favourite of season one. <laughs> I love that uh, one. <laughs> so that's one of the ones that's kind of really dated and kind of... <laughs> I love bad. it because of that. <laughs> yeah, but there's still a lot of kind of fun stuff. I mean, I think it's Giles says that, Giles, it should be smelly speech is hilarious. <laughs> and again, again, not being filler and throw away, it's the first episode with Jenny Calendar in it. Yeah, very casually oh, introduced I love in that episode. Jet Allender. Don't my, my <laughs> trauma from my twenties, Matt. What we're talking about, Giles, though. Oh, I mean, I remember kind of gently fancying him twenty years ago. Now I'm a similar age to the age Anthony Head was when he did this. He is distractively sexy. Oh my fuck! <laughs> He's just hot. I love nerds. And he's so nerdy, and men in tweed clearly are my thing now I'm in my mid-40s. Oh, yeah. he's fit. <laughs> How old is Giles supposed to be, actually? I can't. Probably about my age, which is incredibly annoying. I'm the same age as old people. When did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I bet the reality is Anthony Heard was not uh, that okay. old. Okay, so the uh, the Buffy wiki um, puts his back date of birth in about 1954. Okay, which... so 97 minus 54. 43... Fuck, he's younger than me. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, Holy Oh no, <laughs> I'm older than Giles in series one of Buffy. Fuck my life. Have you read any of the comic canon comics post? I read series eight. It was okay. Angel and Faith in part season ten. Yeah, Giles comes back in a big way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think we, this is actually worth talking about. We, we're talking about how the comics go crazy further beyond what we'd seen in the telly show. But in my brain, I think peak Buffy was like series five, series six. And so in my head, that's what the Buffy cast's main or 
how I see the Buffy cast around series five, series six. And it was really, really nice to go back and watch series one and see pre out Willow and incredibly shallow Cordelia before she went through all the trauma that made her one of the most interesting characters in Angel. And it just felt like almost like a palate cleanse to go back and watch series one of Buffy. Yeah, I think it's kind of, um, it's very interesting anyway. So a lot of them people kind of argue about, <laughs> about whether there's character development, there's character development in Buffy. It's one of these key kind of selling points, I think, as a as a show. But yeah, it's kind of ni- nice just to see them in those kind of kind of roles and stuff. And particularly, I think, where you've got Xander as the everyman character and Willow is just, at the moment, kind of the secondary kind of exposition tool rather than what she becomes adorable nerd yeah. and it's a nice start but her journey to what she becomes at the end of series six is fantastic but adorable nerd is is adorable for adorable <laughs> sake at this point and i there's, like that there's a couple of interesting things particularly in like kind of in retrospective looking back there's a couple of very interesting things that are completely coincidental i think there's a slight discussion about when they think that the, the killer's human and I think the only, first time that ever gets across is actually when it's fate in season three about a human that kills kills another human. I can't remember what it was, but there's just like a, there's a line from Willow about killing someone or being human stuff. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's completely unintentional. But there's a you could argue that's foreshadowing, but it's not. Mm. Well, even yeah. but, uh, even before uh, Faith, I thought of the episode Ted. A big part of that episode is Buffy thinking she's killed someone. Yeah, but- it gets undone by yeah. the twist. But there's a solid moment where Buffy is really reeling from the fact that she may have killed someone. I'm not a fan of Ted as an episode. <laughs> actually, thinking about it, but uh, yeah, even just despite like John Ritter playing against type, but uh, yeah, I'm not much a fan of that one. But um, also, the, there's another one which where uh, like there's Snyder who part of me kind of just wants to rewatch it just because I know I'm going to enjoy Snyder a lot more where it goes, Oh yeah. The uh, principal flutie might've gone for that liberal touchy <laughs> crap. <laughs> touchy feely crap. But that's the liberal, the woolly, the, the woolly liberal headed thinking that leads to getting eaten. And I'm like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. He's not, he's not going to be the last principal of that school to be eaten by a demon mate. <laughs> It's wonderful. And I think Schneider is deliciously malevolent. And there's always that undertone about how much he knows. And they seed it immediately on his introduction as well. You know, getting eaten. He, I love the fact that they don't know if he knows she's the Slayer or not. Mm. And they never answer that before he gets killed. And that's fucking great. I think that, you know, you do have elements of your life that you're like, how much does this person know? And you never find out. I, I mean, years and years ago, um, I used to be part of a writing community, which is where I met. We made this founder, Tony Black, through like kind of fan fiction, kind of like writing fan fiction scripts and stuff. And OK, it's only been kind of like the last five, six years. But part, and I've never done it for ages, but part of me is thinking, you know what? I would love if I love someone to kind of think of a Buffy reboot, we'll call it Snyder. <laughs> and have and have Snyder be the main character, having to deal with troublesome youths who he thinks he are kind of responsible for the deaths of all these kids in his new place of work and stuff. But uh, brilliant, that would be brilliant. Yeah. Um. The final kind of interesting foreshadowing as well is again completely unintentional. Completely unintentional is that um, the character of Morgan is actually suffering from a brain tumor, and there's a line from Buffy going, "Ooh, like." particularly after because like she finds Morgan's brain and once and like kind of shivers once she learns that the brain had a brain tumor and it's like Oof. and the brain tumor is what kills her mom yeah and I think that again unintentional foreshadowing but it's one of those things where it's like it's it's very kind of like weirdly close to it <laughs> that episode is one of the greatest television episodes of all time it kind of comes out of nowhere and it breaks the format and it is brutal but it's just remarkable television i bloody love buffy Hmm. there's some horrible shit in buffy some terrible terrible storylines but sometimes buffy is in remarkable television and i I, do you know whilst it wasn't one of the most deep episodes i really like this episode i always really liked this episode and I think it's great fun and well worth a watch. 
I think it's still entertaining and it's one that, I mean, it's not one that is probably high on my list of episodes to watch. It's, it's probably going to end, I think, it's probably going to end up in the lower half or the lower quarter purely on the basis of the strength of other episodes. But, I mean, there there are kind of really crap episodes, mm. or episodes I kind of dislike for a multitude of reasons. And that I probably rank lower than this one, like Top of My Head, Bad Eggs, for example, in season oh. two, all the way in season six. Him in season seven. A lot of season seven ain't great. Mm, I think so, yeah. I, I think I'm still slightly bitter that they just couldn't be out. They couldn't just get Eric Balfour back and finally answer the, will they ever reference Jesse again? But uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> that was the closest they'd ever gotten to almost bringing Jesse back. They really should have done. That would have been a really fun, deep cut. I think Eric, Eric Balfour had like scheduling conflicts and he just, because they tried, because there was a whole thing where it was, cause Nicholas Brendan would have been at, well, Xander would have had his his own kind of storyline talking to the first as Jesse. And, right. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things. And one of the things um, I never spoke to you about that I had planned for, for aforementioned Buffy rewatch podcast that never happened was every time, every episode that I would have been on, I would have gone, now, where could we have referenced Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know you liked the Jesse character, but fucking hell that. To be fair, it's not that. It's just the fact that he's never brought up ever again. It is cruel. That's the, that's what annoys me about it. They should have been more traumatised than they were by the death of their friend in the very first episode. Or was it the yeah. second episode? Uh, the second, because it's, second. After, it's after the mausoleum. Because they, yes. Yeah, it's after the mausoleum, because that's when they escape, and then they escape, but then Jesse's not with them. And he goes, oh, boy, you've been upgraded to bait. Sorry. You know, we have Quadruple Dwarf in a... Uh, on Shipwrecks and Camatoes, there is a lot in the first two seasons of Buffy, which is quite well Buffy, that I can probably remember verbatim. Oh, mate, <laughs> the way I talk as a grown man is literally completely influenced by Buffy and Red Dwarf. Half of my phraseology comes from Red Dwarf. Half of my phraseology comes from Buffy. And every time I say these things, unironically, I'm like, Christ, you're 45 years old. And, uh, <laughs> it's, and it's it's been donkey's years since I started watching either of these programmes, but my phraseology is completely and utterly influenced to the point of it being kind of funny by just those two programmes. Even Chucky and Child's Play, I don't quote that. As much as I love it, I don't quote that. I don't. That hasn't formulated the way I speak. Buffy and Red Dwarf, man. You wouldn't understand me without it. <laughs> Again, this is not this episode, but in, it's from the first episode. The many times where someone says something vaguely around, I can't remember the last time that happened or when did that happen. My mind immediately goes to 1833, Madrid. She caught me sleeping. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is which is um, Brian Thompson where he goes like, I fought a slave. Do you have proof? Only that she fought me and still lives. I can't remember the last time that happened. 1833, Madrid. She caught me sleeping. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is quite a deep cut. Shall we actually talk about the comparisons between Sid and Chucky? Because I have made some notes on that. The camera angle at the very, very start, the cold open, that really did feel very Chucky like the way he was running around. I liked that. And I think it was probably quite heavily influenced by Chucky. What do you think, Dev? Yeah, there were scenes from a point of view. Mm. But then. I only watched this yesterday, but I'm trying to remember at the very start, the point of view you're talking about, does it not do the point of view of the filter and everything of like yeah. the people in on the stage training? And then it goes up to Morgan and Sid. But I think it's supposed to be Mark, I think. But then again, I can't remember. I'm just thinking about it now. Do you actually see But it was Mark? quite low. So it did remind yeah. me of Child's Play. Was he on his hands and knees or something? <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. You don't see him on his hands and knees ever. And also, if it's the POV from someone else, then surely that gives away that it's not said. <laughs> if Sid is on camera. True. But then that can't be a literal POV. But you hear the internal thoughts of the person going, like saying, right, like either brains or heart or something. And I will be flesh is the line, which is, again, a strong parallel to Child's Play, where the whole motivation of Chucky is to get out of the doll and back into someone else's body and be flesh. So again, strong child's play homage here, I think. Another arbitrary red herring, though. I mean, he's a lizard man. 
that's still flash. <laughs> oh shit! Fucking hell! We are deconstructing this quite horribly. <laughs> I like this episode. Stop it. In the Watcher's Guide Volume One, which I have, there's a, a section on the puppet show and. Saying Sid is just one of a long line of terrifying puppets and talking dolls in film and television. From Talking Tina in a classic episode of The Twilight Zone. We're going to look at that. To the horrifying dummy in William Goldman's Magic. Mm-hmm. We've done that. <laughs> Doesn't mention Chucky, though. I would say this is probably mm, loosely, but most inspired by Chucky because the way Sid talks is quite like Chucky. You mm-hmm. know, they are both sort of rough talking adult perverts. <laughs> Yeah, true. But but also, I would suggest Fats in Magic is quite similar to... Oh, yeah, there probably would be a direct reference, if the writer said, yeah. But you obviously don't see the, the POV of the camera in Magic. Neither do you have any kind of issues with people not believing you when you say the dummy's alive in Magic, which that is directly from Child's Play. So, you know, no one believes that the dummy is alive and Morgan's real fear is, is tangible. And that as much as Morgan is older than Andy is in child's play, I do think that is quite clearly influenced by child's play. I've also got the monster book, which is basically about all the different things that happen in the show. I'm trying to see if I can, if there's anything on Sid in this. Sid probably doesn't count as a monster, does he? Not Technically, no, I guess he is just a human soul in a puppet. By the way, this is, uh, I, I, I remembered it earlier, and it's never going to come from anywhere else. Two people that did uh, did want to bring back Sid were the writers of this episode because they wrote that Chaos Bleeds game. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Dean Batali and Rob Des Hotel. Um, Rob Des Hotel, who sadly passed away in 2018 due to suspected heart attack. I think he was kind of like a long-term writing partner with Dean Batali. Yeah, I saw that. They wrote like about a dozen episodes together. For this, the, there was like story editors for the first two seasons, but they hmm. had both written Never Kill a Boy in the First Date, this one, Dark Age, Phases, and Killed by Death. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, there are kind of weird, similar tonal parallels between them. Yeah, this is the one that I think they kind of get a lot better with kind of keying in a kind of theme for the episode, which they never really did with this one. And uh, interesting enough, the director of this episode, Ellen S. Pressman, only directed another... Oh, I saw this one. <laughs> yeah, only directed another episode of the of the show in two, season two. Do you have any idea who, which episode that is, Mark? I'm probably not going to like the episode you said. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're going to guess, to base, based on this episode, what season four episode or episodes do you suspect she may have directed? Because I think there is a kind of very weird, almost similar directional vibe between the two episodes. So, as soon oh as yeah, there is. Yeah, there season is. two or season four. Season two. Season two. So as soon as I saw that she, the only other episode she directed was that one. I was like, oh yeah, there's a very weird kind of. It's competent enough, but I can kind of, I can kind of tell why she never came back to do episodes after the episodes she directed in season two. I'm drawing a blank here. Um... I mean, it's probably not <laughs> at the forefront of your mind when thinking about Buffy. <laughs> or thinking about season two episodes of Buffy. <laughs> so Becoming, it's not that. No. Um, I think Goofy, Mark of the Week ones. <laughs> I mean, is it as obvious as Bad Eggs, which you mentioned earlier that you don't like? No, it's not that one. Um, okay, full disclosure, I've got the episode's titles up in front of me now. Um. Oh, Christ, was it Inca Mummy Girl? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's that one. No, Inca Mummy Girl, no. As you were but... insinuating, though, uh, Matt, very similar in terms of the monster, the mummy, but they're not actually the bad guy. Yeah, it's a similar plot twist, actually. I think even if you, even if you can give this episode criticisms... As well as well, Inca Mama Girls probably got a bit more criticism towards it because I don't think it's a very good episode. Well, the twist being that the episode itself isn't, she's not an all out and out villain. She's more of a case of uh, morally grey. I need to do stuff to survive, but I don't care what I do to survive. But it conflicts with the moral standing of our protagonists. It's a tragic backstory with moral implications, which, whilst not as heavy, Sid has a very tragic backstory. 
but he's a pervy old man. So there's a, you know, it's it's about grey. You're absolutely right. It's a, it, both episodes are about greyness. But the I think the pervy old man. I think he's all talk and no action when it comes to that. I think he's just. Well, he hasn't got a dick, has he? <laughs> I just personally think he'll just like talk and I think he'll talk rather than do anything or, or mm. act upon it. I think he'll just be leery and just be that drunken blog on the in the pub that have just made those comments rather than actually physically. Yeah, yeah. I, and I I also think that Sid potentially is just a character that when it comes down to it, we'll probably pick saving the world over getting his end away. Whereas yeah. I think where like, if you've got the income character who literally True. has to, has to drain the life of people to survive and doesn't seem to want to be able to find a way of getting around that. I think the kind of the pervy dummy is perhaps morally the more upstanding. Oh yeah. 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 I think we've talked about this, you know, his characteristics in scenes as they come, but I do think, I do think a good a decent detail in writing is in that scene when he reveals that the by breaking the spell, he's not coming back. He presumably accepted his death years ago and has been wanting to die. So I think that sets up a very, that retroactively goes back and sets up a, like a very sympathetic angle to all of his perviness. That it is oh, all yeah. because yeah. He, he doesn't expect to actually get any action because he's wanting to die. Yeah, yeah, it's actually very tragic. But the more you think about it, the more tragic it becomes. And you can almost argue that he's so anti everything in the world and bitter about what was done to him that there is very little left other than the desire to die. So maybe he's got the right to be a cantankerous <laughs> pervy old shitbag. But I also think that he's, as a demon hunter as well, I think he, and going back to my kind of idea that with a slightly revised draft, is that he's got his own calling. Then again, though, I mean, this is a whole different conversation uh, for a Buffy podcast that'll never happen, but whether he whether he actually <laughs> actively had, the, he made the choice to be a demon hunter rather than told he had to be, whereas Buffy really has no choice. Yes. Into being who she is and what part of her arc throughout at least the first four or five years is her kind of proactively seeing that she has this role and does it. Whereas Sid has been doing this thing for years and years, actively chose to become a demon hunter and is actively knowing that he has his kind of peace once he completes his reward. So he, instead of just going around trying to find a way to become human again, which probably technically possibly could happen, this is the Buffy world, so he probably could find a way of getting himself out of the body the usual way, <laughs> the villain way of just killing people and harvesting their organs so that the dummy becomes human again. He actively is not doing that. He is finishing the work he started in stopping the, the seven of these kind of demon brothers mm. from, from killing any more people. I think it subtly and quite early on gives you a power level of what some of these demons potentially have that Buffy will be facing in future. She will face some incredibly powerful demons with insurmountable odd level of um, power. And that's what Sid's been fighting for such a long time. And that's why he's so old and jaded and grumpy and et cetera. And that's, again, the, the more I look at this, again, I, I guess I've never watched Buffy with a kind of analytical eye. I've just enjoyed it for what it is. We would have done great on a Buffy podcast, mm -hmm. but yeah. we're still not fucking doing it. Um, I would say definitely similar to that point in terms of either subtle or underutilized. When you're talking about his past, I see it as very similar to a parallel that they didn't make in the episode, but a parallel to him and that Slayer from the 30s, that he was maybe a Xander or a Willow who was friends with that Slayer, just a normal person. And then because they fell in love, he joined that world and became, you know, a monster hunter. But he was just a human. Hmm. Yeah. There's quite a lot of deepness in this episode that you don't spot initially because it's like, oh, dummy, twist, 45 minutes, done. Well, that's the other thing I wanted to get into as well, in terms of we've been talking so much about Sid, developing him as a character from halfway into the episode. The character of Morgan disappears once he dies what exactly did you think he was getting out of this? Because it's never really explored what his relationship with Sid is. Mm. Mm. True. 
really his brain tumor is only because of the twist that the the killer needs a good brain. Mm. But other than that, it doesn't seem to connect with Sid in any way. Like, and the way it's set up in terms of the the red herring, it seems like Morgan doesn't want to be a part of this, or maybe does, but he's nervous. Like, yeah, it, you really have no idea why yeah. Morgan is doing any of this. They don't go into his motivation at all. You're right, and they don't even really say because he is a, you know a character for this episode, and it's conveniently set around the talent show. Did he just meet Sid? Has he had Sid for a while? It's unclear. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I don't know if I actually thought about that. Yeah, he's, he's peripheral. And then as soon as like he's gone, he's gone. He's not really mentioned apart. Yeah, it's kind of awkward that in a moment of good direction, I do think the quote-unquote death of Sid, well, you know, his release. I think that's a really touching moment. You know, how quiet it is. Everyone's just taken at the moment. But then, yeah, Morgan, the actual human person, <laughs> he dies like off camera and then... That's it, he's gone. Just another student for season one today, a kill. And Sid doesn't mourn him either. No, So yeah. what was their relationship? Huh. I think Sid kind of like dismisses Morgan, I think. Mm. I think I can't remember if it's after they discover he's dead where he goes like, oh yeah, I should have gone with you guys rather than the kid. I'm like, so why the flipping hell? What, what about Morgan? Did Sid find, yeah, this is my sidekick? Yeah, I think I never thought about that. It's also uh, a dick move since after yeah. the twist we learned that Sid was a human. It is like, shouldn't he have any sympathy towards mm. uh, this other human? Yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so I think th- it, this is a flawed episode. There are some great elements to it. I think the Sid character was a really cool concept with a fascinating backstory and something that could have definitely been explored much more deeply. There are some weak elements of the plot. But I do think it was a genuinely good mystery. Uh, you know, was it Morgan? Was it Snyder? Was it Sid? Was it someone else you're not thinking about? Fucking hell, was it Cordy? Whatever. I still think I really like this episode. It might just be because there's a fucking doll in it. But I, I really like this episode. I, I, I would have liked to have seen more Sid. And the introduction of Schneider, who is a favourite character of mine. Yeah, I, I think it's quite high up on my list of Series one episodes, for sure. Yeah, I enjoy it as well. I think we've mentioned the word filler episode. I think you could, if you wanted to, you could skip this episode. I mean, like the introduction of Snyder, he'll be in the next episode and you'll get who he is almost immediately. So I don't think there's anything pivotal you need to know in this episode. But for all the faults of it being an average episode, it's still early Buffy and it's still Buffy. So it's it's a fun episode. I'm running through the season in my head. As you said that, I still think this is probably in my lower third of the season in comparison to other episodes. I think perhaps Teacher's Pet is probably the <laughs> is probably the weakest for me. Yeah, so this yeah this this technically could be eleventh actually thinking about it. I don't see it. I, I think this is a fun episode. I mean, as a, again as as Buffy as a whole, there are always always moments lines kind of little character moments in every single episode even the even the really bloody awful ones like beer bad uh, <laughs> where oh yeah buffy in its relationship to alcohol is a whole different story <laughs> there are at least a couple of moments that even the kind of average ones will always have a moment which are like oh that's slightly higher than my favorite moments like dead man's party in season three average episode but kind of pivotal to kind of get the balance of the the characters after season season two three break has that goes look at my mask isn't it pretty raises the dead americans which is still one of my favorite one of my favorite jaws lines this one still has that as well i mean i mean there are moments in this that are stuck in my head they're still stick in my head but i think in comparison to moments or things that i like more in season one it's quite low down it's a bit of a shame because again snyder's great but and it's a shame that he's first episodes that low down for me but I think in comparison to what I feel about other episodes in season one, it's near the bottom. It's also the only ever episode of the show which has a not post credits, but I don't know what the I don't know what the terminology is, but during credit sequence. Mm. It's the only thing it's the only episode that has that when you actually see their acting. <laughs> yes. In terms of wanting to watch this episode, if you like the Scooby comedy stuff, this is a really good episode from season one for that. There's a lot of funny moments in this. Like, just mm. right at the start, Cordelia butchering Whitney Houston is so funny. Actually, to be fair, on his credit, I think 
that is probably the closest this episode has to its usual spinning of, teen, of teenage tropes. So if you're thinking of, I don't know, like the Peter Engel stuff, like say by the Bell, USA High, what's it called, California Dreams or whatever it's called, those kind of shows where you've got the popular kind of lead, kind of Cordelia-like character who suddenly is also able to sing when they have their talent show stuff. So they've got all the characters that are able to do their talent stuff. So I'm pretty sure there's an episode of Side by the Bell and Side by the Bell, the new class, where Zach Morris somehow manages to form opera or something, something stupid like that. Or at least pretend or fake wow. it. Or anything like that. But I quite like the fact that they didn't go the trope of having Cordelia also be a good singer, which I think is a very kind of nice trope on that. It was something that Buffy did well, was actually give characters flaws. And yeah. protagonists and antagonists all had strengths and flaws. And that was always something that was really well done in Buffy. And I think maybe watching Buffy influenced how I like to play RPGs. I don't want to play a perfect character. I want to play a character with flaws. And I've always found that more fun as an RPG character. I think my favourite kind of character is here. Two good, overly good ones, like where the, their kind of optimism is pretty much flaw in itself like leslie nope or um, sam beckett from quantum leap like forgive forgive the dd is it lawful good is that is that the right term yeah that, yeah lawful good is lawful great <laughs> so is that like sam beckett leslie nope kind of uh so yeah lo- lawful means you follow a strict set of rules not necessarily laws and good means you are fundamentally good yeah it's very old track like tng yeah, for the most part. <laughs> okay, uh, so you could argue, so you could argue Buffy's lawful good for a while, yeah. But that's what's good about the show. That's what's so revolutionary about Buffy in TV, and that it was a teenager show that gets very dark and gets very real. But then <laughs> it like, wears I mean, down the characters. So those characters could move around those alignment charts type thing. So, um, so you've got Wesley Wyndham Price from Angel that just goes from. Um, yeah, you haven't seen Angel yet, Devon, but <laughs> you need to get on it because I know quite a bit about him. <laughs> Well, Wesley's definitely lawful good to the point of being uselessly so. <laughs> but, then, but then, like, will that, does that change? Can you, that change? Yes. Change of definitely. Very much so. Yeah. He becomes almost, I would say, pure neutral. Well, maybe not. He's still probably lawful thinking about it because yeah. even though his code of honour changes, he follows his own very strict rules. So again, like I say, lawful doesn't necessarily mean you follow the law of the land, but you follow a very strict code that you don't breach. So he would definitely become lawful neutral or even lawful evil with some of the stuff that he does. Okay. I say, yeah, I think what I was talking about Buffy as a whole, I'm going to say that Wesley's my favourite arc throughout the the whole universe, actually. Sublime. Yeah. If you want to talk about people that stay within the D&D circle, Harmony just stays Harmony. <laughs> Right. Yes, she the does. entire Buffy verse. Chaotic evil <laughs> for the whole fucking time. Yes, you're right. Harmony is definitely not harmonious. Uh, dear. Is there anything else that we want to talk about, specifically the puppet show, rather than marking out about Buffy? Yeah. Um, I quite like the fact that they bring Giles out of his comfort zone. He has to do actual schoolwork. Yeah. 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 And there's quite a nice thing where he says, like, oh, where the new boss has said that he, he wants him to kind of interact with the student body more. And he goes, I did try to explain that my vacation was to limit that as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then again, then again, though, saying that, one of the things that I know since I've worked in education is that one of the things that I know that's going to ruin a rewatch for me is that I'm going to be rewatching Buffy. And the amount of fucking safeguarding concerns I would have to raise with Giles. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I've been, yeah, I've been overly familiar with students, and my god, he's a walking, talking safeguarding concern. Even thinking about it, that's one of those uh, on the nose things where they sort of reference that by like season two or season three, where they say that no one goes into the library, yeah. <laughs> so it's never a problem. But yeah, I mean. Yeah, he's other familiarity with the st- with those kind of three students. Um... <laughs> yeah, it's just three people that like, he knows so well. Yeah, <laughs> it's generally quite concerning when I think about it <laughs> on a safeguarding level. Oh dear. Well, Matt, I knew I'd enjoy this because the Buffy podcast was something we always intended to do, but 
It's not happening. And the reason is Joss Whedon's a bastard. But this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and whatever the fuck Twitter's called nowadays. Twitter. It's still called Twitter. <laughs> I think if I just don't deactivate it because it's driving me up the wall at the moment. Basically, if you search for Pick a Disc, which is the podcast where I talk about music, whatever's most likely it's going to be me on Flash, on Threads, Instagram, whatever. You can also then find me on a show that you might have heard of called Shit Wrestling Comatose, which is a Red Dwarf podcast <clears throat> hosted by Mark. That's me. And our friend Kurt, um, <laughs> with a few other friends of ours, uh, Carl and Colin. And also, I'm, I'm also um, currently working on a second season of another podcast called Ask Us About Loom, where I talk about interactive fiction, adventure games, and kind of narrative-led choose your own adventure slash that was kind of like unique types type games where like choose your own adventure but in digital form or point click adventures and stuff so that's ask us about loom as well so season two that should be coming up later in the, the last third of this year dev where can people find you on the internet people can find me at twitter at absolute travesty i'm not many other places that <laughs> right good and if you're looking for me, you can find me at Mark Adams HC on Instagram and Twitter. If you are interested in wrestling, it's Mark Adams Announcer on Facebook. If you're interested in my work as a humanist celebrant, it is Mark Adams Humanist Celebrant on Facebook. I kind of do other podcasts as well. I've, I've been guesting on a lot recently, but the other one I do regularly was mentioned by Matt at Red Dwarf Pod on Twitter. So until next time, until next week... What a play. I don't get it. Is it avant-garde? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dev. <laughs> Chucky Vision is a podcast brought to you by the We Made This Network. Follow us on Twitter at Chucky Vision. Follow the network on Twitter at WMT underscore network. Our website is we made this network.com. The logo was designed by Dev and the theme tune composed by Dark Fantasy Studios. Do you like pop culture and top 10 lists? If you do, then step inside the Den of 10. In the Den, we have countless top 10 lists to captivate and titillate even the weariest soul. We've got lists of films. And there's that famous thing about the, the scene where he improvised his way through smashing his hand and cutting his hand open on the glass as he banged his hand on the table. Yeah. I mean, you can't really say boo to that. Music. The rest of the song is like a, just a swirling crescendo of clever songwriting, amazing singing, great drumming, like beautiful guitar effects. Video games. And I think that's exactly what happened with Zelda. It was everything looking back is on a much lower resolution to what we see in Breath of the Wild. But as I was playing it, I just felt like my imagination was just going absolutely wild. TV. You know, this is where a sitcom verges on the cinematic, still in a, in a neat 20 minutes. And the interaction between these vastly different characters is so well realised. And more. Listen to us on all major podcast providers. Find us on Twitter at Den of Ten Pod, where you can like, follow, comment, and vote. Or find us on the We Made This Podcast Network at WeMadeThisNetwork.com. We hope to see you soon in the Den of Ten. What do you both think? Should we do a three episode series? Yeah, I'm up for it. I've got to watch that episode. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I'll watch that episode, yeah. I've seen the scene. I, I do know what you're talking about. I've seen the the, the scene of Spike and Puppet Angel fighting. It's a bloody puppet. <laughs> yeah, so if we make October a three-part series rather than a two-part series, it just makes sense that we've had you on for this and then 
kind of organically <laughs> realised, oh yeah, another puppet. Yeah. Should we do it? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network. <laughs>